very much for that. Oh my, welcome. You are terrific. And I am so grateful to all of you because you've given me an incredible gift. A gift of life with Star Trek for 54 years now. 54 years. And you are all responsible for it. Even if you weren't born 54 years ago, <laughs> you've still joined us in this amazing phenomenon called the Star Trek phenomenon. We came on, uh, on the air back in 1966, and at that time, maybe we were, we were too futuristic for our audience because our ratings were low, very low. And NBC threatened to cancel us after the second season. But then some of the early fans who had discovered Star Trek were so determined to give Star Trek further life that they organized and began a campaign, a letter writing campaign. I mean, it's not like sending emails. You need a sheet of paper and a pen or a pencil and you wrote on paper, and you put it in an envelope, and then put a 13 cent stamp on it. Can you imagine? <laughs> and you dropped it in a box called a mailbox. Do any of you know what that is? <laughs> we are in the 21st century, and we lived in a whole different primitive age there. There's a man that came and picked up all the mail in the mailbox <laughs> and took it to the post office where it was all sorted and it was put on a plane and it went to wherever you, uh, you addressed it to. The Star Trek fans addressed it to not only NBC Studios but to Paramount Studios and it was an articulate, eloquent series of letters we reached a quality audience. You knew how to express yourselves, and you did it very persuasively. And because of that fan letter writing, they gave us another season, a third season. And I'm proud to say that my own father was one of those that wrote the letter to NBC. Yes, he did. But he was honest, he said, I'm George Takei's father, <laughs> and so obviously I'm biased. But Star Trek is an unusual show, he said. It's got a message, a statement, that is very important to our times today. It was a very divided time back, back in the 60s. It was a turbulent time, and I'm sure all of you know what a turbulent time is because we're going through one right now. It, it, we're a very divided society. Back then, in the 60s, it was a very div divided society. We had the civil rights movement going. People who were campaigning for equal rights and they were being attacked by law enforcement people with attack dogs and fire hoses. There was a war going on in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War, that was tearing this country apart. There were half the country was, uh, were supporting it, and the other half was campaigning for peace. Uh, I was one of those on the uh, peace campaign, together with my uh, colleagues in Hollywood, people like Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland. And there was another cultural revolution going on called the hippie movement. They were being very creative. They had uh, they created songs, music, and art, and people, uh, the uh, normal society just didn't understand it. They didn't understand the music. They didn't understand the art, and so there was a great, uh, huge social turmoil going on. And at a time like this, Star Trek came on with the message of hope for the future. It, it said the Starship Enterprise was a metaphor for Starship Earth, and the strength of this Starship lay in its diversity, all the different parts, 
coming together and working in, uh, as a team, working in concert as a team. And that was the strength of the Starship Enterprise. It was an important message at, at a time like that. And some people were taking it to heart and things were happening. Although it wasn't happening to Star Trek because the ratings remained low. <laughs> and we were canceled in 1969. But that very same year, we landed the Apollo mission on the surface of the moon. Two astronauts landed on the moon and waddled about in the spacesuits. It was an amazing human achievement. So there was hope for the future. Actually, for, though, for us who worked on Star Trek, what was accomplished by the Apollo mission looked very old-fashioned. <laughs> All that gawky hardware coming down in a parachute. And out of that, that hardware come human beings in these marshmallow outfits waddling around. On Star Trek, what we did was we stepped on the transporter pod, <laughs> sparkled for a few seconds, <laughs> popped out, and arrived at the destination and sparkled again and popped in. Futuristic. Believe me, I still, to this day, earnestly hope for the early invention of the transporter. <laughs> but we did it, as old-fashioned and as gawky as it was. I am associated with that show, and that changed my life and my career. I, you gave us a special gift of association with this extraordinary show, which today is still going strong. A franchise 54 years old and still having new children. The newest show is Star Trek Picard. And I met two of the actors uh, in the green room today, they, it, Star Trek is it, like, uh, well, it, it's like triples. We just bring, <laughs> multiply, and multiply, and multiply. Uh, uh, not only is it a, a TV spin-offs, but feature films, uh, books, and uh, and uh, we're called action figure now. My mother loved that. She used to tell all her friends, my son used to, uh, used to be a doll when he was a little boy. He's a grown-up man, and he's still a doll. <laughs> and so these are the kind of gifts that you all gave me. And that's amplified my voice so that I've been able to do things that I probably would never have been able to to make commentaries on our society, to be an advocate for equality and justice, social uh, justice. <laughs> Thank you very much, because that's the gift that you gave me. And so I appreciate it very much. Star Trek is now 54 years old, with so many, not only children, but grandchildren. And that is an extraordinary gift. 54 years, the passage of time. But other things happen over the passage of time. There are losses. People that we work with, people we work together as colleagues. And the wonderful thing about Star Trek is that these work colleagues have become lifelong friends and literally the entire lives of some of my colleagues have been my friends. Exactly five years ago this week, we lost Leonard Nimoy. He was what some people call the conscience of Star Trek. He was an extraordinary human being and an extraordinary actor. That character, Spock, was created by 
by uh, Leonard in so many ways. He had an inventive mind. For example, the spark pinch was something that he invented on the set. The Vulcan Green was something that he introduced from his Jewish heritage as the Vulcan Green lived long and prosper. He was a creative artist, but beyond that, he became a very good and supportive friend. And uh, we used to sit, sit, uh, sit aside, and he was my political uh, uh, soulmate, I guess. We talked about the current events of the time. And uh, also, he became a very good supporter of mine. Leonard did uh, this, this great play, Equus, about uh, a psychiatrist and a very disturbed young boy and his relationship with a horse. Some of you may be familiar with the play or with the movie version. Leonard did it on, uh, on Broadway, on stage. It was first uh, played by uh, Anthony Hopkins, Anthony, um, Anthony Hopkins, and then uh, Richard Burton, and then uh, Anthony Perkins did it as well. And finally, Leonard uh, did the play on Broadway. I got a chance to do that uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, one night, the ushers came backstage and said, Leonard Nimoy's in the audience. He just came in with his wife. I was really thrilled by that. But Leonard had done the role that I'm doing on Broadway. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt nervous. Uh, I did the best I could on, 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 on stage in that performance. And then after the performance, uh, Leonard came backstage to talk to me. And so I, when he walked in uh, with that uh, uh, inimitable Leonard Nimoy smile, I said, well, Leonard, how do I do? <laughs> Leonard smiled that Leonard Nimoy smile and said, you were better. He is a liar. <laughs> but he is a clever. Obviously, he couldn't, you know, say, I was better than you. <laughs> he said, I was better. We, um, one of my missions in life is to raise the awareness of the uh, internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War. And we developed a musical in order to humanize that story. And uh, we first did it in San Diego uh, at the uh, very well-respected regional theater, uh, the uh, Old Globe Theater. And he and his wife drove down from Los Angeles to see me in that. And he, he came backstage to uh, say hello to me again. But he was uh, surrounded by the other cast members backstage. and I. I got, uh, didn't have much of a chance to chat with them, but the, the uh, cast was thrilled that Leonard came to uh, see the show and support me. And uh, then the next project I uh, had was a documentary that was done on uh, uh, my relationship with Brad, my hubby, and that was filmed as a documentary. And we had the first screening of that documentary at the Screen Actors Guild, or Screen Directors Guild Theater in Hollywood. And I sent invitations to my colleagues, but uh, I didn't expect Leonard to come because he had been ill for some time. But the ushers came up to me again and said, Leonard Nimoy is in the parking lot. He's coming up. When he came in, he was on a wheelchair. He was very ill. He, uh, his affliction was what's called COPD, congestive obstructive pulmonary disease. And he carried his uh, oxygen tank on his lap and he had all the uh, tubes coming out. Even in that condition, he came to support me to, uh, at the first screening of our documentary. He was a very dear friend. And uh, exactly five years ago this week, we lost him. 
There are others that we've lost. Jimmy Doon. I called him my favorite drinking buddy. I learned a lot about drinking from him. I love Chateau Luz de Pop because of Leonard, I mean, uh, uh, Jimmy Doon. And he told me that I'm becoming famous as a Scotsman. But to tell you the truth, I'm really an Irishman. <laughs> yes, he's an Irishman. But I, I guess there are a few Irish people here. I heard that uh, applause for him. He said, I'm a Canadian, Irish Canadian, born in Vancouver, British Columbia. But, he said, I've drunk enough of the libation of Scotland to qualify playing a Scotsman. <laughs> and he did qualify. I'm a witness to it. We uh, lost to Forrest, D. Kelly, a sweet, gentle, and shy, of, strangely for an actor because Actors are pretty much uh, uh, gregarious people, but uh, Dee was very shy. Naturally, he didn't like conventions too much because there were too many people. He liked small conventions with few, very few people. And so he would have had a very uncomfortable time at this convention here <laughs> at the McCormick Place in Chicago. We lost so many people. And most of all, we lost uh, Gene Roddenberry, the great visionary who created Star Trek. So the past in time gives us some gifts and wonderful uh, memories, but at the same time, there's loss. But they've left a great legacy, and we're very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful to all of you with your support. Whether you were there or not from the very beginning, because, you know, when the lights come on, I know the original sewer. <laughs> I can pick out who you are. I've changed the color of my hair, too. And some of you have no hair. You guys are the original fans, and we're eternally grateful to you. But Star Trek fans, too, are like triples. They reproduce themselves over and over and over again. And many of you are the next generation. And, and now the next generation is bringing your own little ones, little triples, in parks here. And so we thank you all very much for all of the wonderful gifts that you've given us. And uh, Star Trek is always hopeful. And I share that hope. Who knows, there might be another Star Trek film with other interesting cameo roles. <laughs> I'd like to come back as an alien. <laughs> but the fun part of the Star Trek convention is uh, the conversation. So uh, let's bring the lights up and uh, I understand there are mics out there. So uh, let's begin the conversation with, uh, I see a mic there. Let's begin with you. Hello, thank you for coming to the convention. Thank you for coming. Yes, um, I'm Katie, I'm from Sioux City, Iowa, and I recently got involved with our theater in our city. And I'm a little worried starting because I don't have the best memory when it comes to scripts. And I was wondering if you have any recommendations on how to memorize lines and make them feel genuine and not just scripted. Well, you have to have the ability to memorize lines. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, but particularly with theater, I love the theater. And when you walk on the stage without your lines, you might as well make a U-turn and go off because uh, you can't function. It's re repetition over and over again, but also to understand the meaning of the lines that you're trying to memorize. Know what you want to say, and if you know what the intent is, and you memorize the intent, 
the words will come. I mean, if you uh, love someone and it's a scene where you uh, uh, are coming together, if you really play the love for that person that you have, the words that you've been trying to memorize will come naturally. If you've uh, uh, read the script and understand it and, and repeated uh, the line to yourself over and over. If you can't remember it, then you're in trouble, certainly in the theater. With film and television, we do what we call takes. And that means you get a chance to do it over again if you can't get the line on the first take. My last name is spelled T-A-K-E-I. Some people mispronounce that. They think it's T-A-K-E-1. Take one. <laughs> so I've got that reputation as George Take One. And I, when I come on the set, I have it all up here and here. And so I, well, you know, it's not just the actor. It's the uh, lighting and the camera work and all. So it's a teamwork. But uh, as far as my part is concerned, I have it on Take One. <laughs> take one. To, George Takei, take one. Thank you so much. Um, David from Chicago. Um, from your roles, it gives the impression like you've been studying the sword for like your whole life, like at least seven years' experience. Even like the only good season of Heroes where you were in. Uh, <laughs> like, or obscure work like your mentor role in Ninja Cheerleader. But, like, has there ever been a role where somebody actually let you cut loose with those skills? Or was it just avoiding all the stereotypical roles that were going around in the 60s for her that you were like avoiding? Well, actually, um, you're making reference to uh, Naked Time on Star Trek. When I first saw that script, and it was written by John D.F. Black, and he was on the set, and he sat down beside me, and uh, actually, I, uh, uh, what, I didn't read the script, he was telling me what uh, his script uh, has me doing, and he said, he said he was thinking of putting uh, a samurai sword in my hand, and I would terrorize uh, the Enterprise, the crew of the Enterprise, by assaulting them with my samurai sword. And I, I told him, well, that's interesting, because uh, I'm of Japanese ancestry, and uh, that is the traditional uh, sword of uh, ancient Japan. But I said, when I was a kid, I never played uh, samurai. I told him, I, I, uh, my parents took, took me to see uh, Earl Flynn in The Adventures of Robin Hood, and I was swept away by that. And uh, I, I came back and I had my mother make me a, a, a Robin Hood uniform, and my uh, backyard became Sherwood Forest, and I had my mother make uh, Maid Marian's costume and uh, a Friar Tuck's uh, costume. And my, uh, I had my own little uh, production company uh, to do uh, uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood. And I, so I told him, why don't we put a fencing foil in Sulu's hands? That might be uh, interesting science, science fiction. And uh, it would, Sulu would see his heritage at not just narrowly uh, racial but or, and cultural, but a broader uh, the heritage of world uh, history. And he said, great, do you uh, know how to fence uh, today? And I said, I told him it's my favorite hobby. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> <laughs> that night I had the uh, yellow pages open. Oops. For those of you that <laughs> Listen to those who aren't applauding <laughs> and explain to them, to the ones that aren't applauding, what yellow pages are. I was looking up uh, 
fencing lessons. And there was one uh, not too far from where I had, where I lived uh, on Sunset Boulevard, Falcon Studios Fencing. And I took my very first formal fencing lesson that Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and I, uh, my teacher was a person uh, named uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Faulkner. And it turned out he was the one that choreographed all of the fencing sequence in uh, Earl F uh, Flynn's Adventures of Robin Hood. So a big circle being uh, completed. Mr. Falk, and he, he uh, stood in for Basil Rathbone uh, because uh, he, he told me that Flynn was terrified of the fencing, uh, 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 of fencing with Basil Rathbone because he was all in control. And so uh, Mr. Faulkner was the one that was fencing with him. And so as a kid, I was watching Mr. Faulkner's back uh, 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 fencing with uh, Earl Flynn. And so that, uh, that was another wonderful, unexpected guest, uh, big gift that I got from Star Trek to meet Mr. Faulkner. So that's my fencing story. I'm John from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Is that part? Wisconsin. I'm part from Chicago. We have a football team. <laughs> connection to Wisconsin. My brother was going to Marquette University in Milwaukee. And, ah, somebody else from uh, Wisconsin. Or from uh, Milwaukee. Or from Marquette University. And uh, he had his baby there in Milwaukee. And uh, that kid is now uh, the father of another kid. <laughs> third generation, but, uh, and I saw the first aired episode of Star Trek back in 1965, uh, 66, uh, at my brother's apartment with this new baby on my lap. And that baby, my nephew, went to sleep on me <laughs> during, during Star Trek. <laughs> So, needless to say, I've been a big fan since I was a kid. Oh, well, thank you for that. Love the movies. I thought Sulu was a great character. And I always, I guess, equated the actor and the character as you know, someone who had a lot of respect and, and someone who you know, became captain of a starship. And I never really thought you know, much beyond that. I knew about your, you know, your, your, your uh, work with the uh, education with the internment camps. And then that's sort of four years ago. And I got a new car and put a free subscription to XM Radio. And I happened to turn on Howard Stern, and you were on. And I thought, this can't, this can't be the same guy. This can't be the same guy that played Mr. Salute. But over the last four years, you have been the greatest guest on Howard Stern of any of them. I've had to pull over as I was crying in tears when you're on Howard Stern. You have low standards. <laughs> Thank you for this video. <laughs> My question is, how did that relationship happen? Did you seek him or did he seek you? It just seems such like an unlikely, an unlikely partnership. Yeah, it's uh, coming together the opposites. Um, back in 19, it was back in the 50s, uh, not, not back in the 90s, uh, I was uh, doing a, a, a play in uh, New York, off Broadway. And when, you, when you're doing a play, the publicist gives you the, your assignment to promote the play every, uh, every morning. And that particular morning, I had uh, this address on Madison Avenue, a show called The Howard Stern Show. I didn't know this man from Adam. It was just a name there. I went there and uh, said, I'm here to do the show. Uh, the uh, publicist set it, up, uh, set it up for me. The receptionist said, please sit down and make yourself comfortable and we'll call you when uh, Mr. Stern is ready. So I sat down, picked up a magazine, and was, I was flipping through it. And they had this radio show on in the real waiting room. The coarsest, crudest <laughs> conversation. And I said to the other guy uh, sitting there, 
why can't they get some nice music on? <laughs> that conversation is disgusting. And he said, that's the show we're waiting to go on. <laughs> Just then, the uh, uh, receptionist, receptionist came and said, oh, oh, Mr. Stern is ready for you tonight. Well, I uh, walked uh, into the uh, studio, and behind the mic is this tall, skinny guy with this wild mane of hair, wearing uh, horn-rimmed glasses. And I said, good morning. And he said, you have a deep voice. <laughs> Anyone with a voice that deep? has to have a big dog. <laughs> I said, are we on the air? And he said, yep. And I said, And so, whether I'm there or not, whenever someone says something outrageous or does something outrageous, he presses that button and my voice comes up. Oh my! And so, it, I, uh, that became notorious and it became my signature, oh my. And then I came out in 94 with my uh, uh, autobiography to the stars, and there again the publicist uh, had that uh, list of uh, shows for me to go on, and so I went down the list and I crossed up the uh, Stern show, <laughs> and she said, "Oh no, George, you've got to do that show," and I said, "No, I don't think his listenership can read." <laughs> <laughs> this elegant, well-tailored woman. Literally got down on her knees and said, George, I implore you, please do that show. He can sell books for us. And so I said, okay, get up, get up, I'll do it. And I did the show again. And so we had this kind of uh, commercial, uh, tra uh, transactional relationship going. But uh, as I think you all know, I'm gay. And I was closeted for most of my life. Oh, I get applause for being gay. <laughs> Back then, you could not work as an actor if, you, if it was known that you were gay. When I was a teenager, there was, uh, well, my hot girl. A, an actor, very good looking actor, blonde and uh, handsome, uh, my heart throb, a guy named Tab Hunter. Some of you recognize that name. He was the star of almost every movie coming from Warner Brothers Studios. And I, he certainly was my favorite actor. Saw every one of his films. But one of the scandal sheets exposed him as being gay, and suddenly he disappeared. Completely disappeared, because he was exposed as gay. And that was a lesson to me. You cannot be gay and work in Hollywood. They will not hire you. And so I was closeted all my adult life. And believe me, it was not a comfortable place to, to be at all. And particularly, you know, I was living a double life. I discovered gay bars, and there I could feel free and comfortable and, and have conversations and, uh, and uh, a bottle of beer. But even there, the older guys told me that we had to, we had to be careful in a gay bar because the police can raid gay bars, and they'll march you all out, load you on a paddy wagon, take, drive you down to the police station, and fingerprint you, take your photo, and put your name on a list. 
That was terrifying. If any of that got released, things would, would start happening. You'd lose your job, you'd lose your career, some people lost their families. And it was so unfair. We were just enjoying each other's company and having a bottle of beer. And they could arrest you and destroy your life. So that became a terrifying thing. And I had to be quiet. I, I wanted to work. My career was going well. And I could not let it be known publicly. And the interesting thing was, in those gay bars, I recognized this. I would recognize faces that I'd seen on screen. And we both kept our mouths shut. We had some guests, the stars on Star Trek, that I recognized. But we didn't talk about it the next morning on the set. And so it was a whole different kind of world that we lived in. And then the AIDS plague hit. And that was terrifying. Friends suddenly got sick, started losing weight drastically. They were soon skin and bone, skeleton, and then they were gone. And they were the ones that were out there campaigning for gay equality, gay liberation. And I felt guilty. I was an activist. I was involved in the civil rights movement, I was involved in the peace movement, I was in, involved in the movement to get an apology for the internment uh, uh, of Japanese Americans. I, I was an activist. But on this issue of gay liberation, I was silent and I felt guilty. But at the same time, when the AIDS plague hit, it was terrifying to me, I'm gay. That might happen to me. I was together with Brad by that time. We got uh, tested and fortunately, we were both negative. But we were losing friends left and right. It was a horrible, terrifying time. And I was closeted until 19, uh, 2000. When things started to happen, well, actually in 2003, Massachusetts got marriage equality through their state Supreme Court. And in 2005, on the West Coast in California, our state legislature passed the marriage equality bill. An amazing thing. Marriage equality, gays being recognized. We could get married. Both houses, the Senate and the Assembly, passed the Marriage Equality Bill. That bill needed one more signature, that of our governor, who happened to be a movie star, Arnold Schwarzenegger. When he ran for governor, he ran by saying, I'm from Hollywood. I've worked with gays and lesbians. Some of my friends are gays and lesbians. Uh, uh, I, my, I'm for equality for gays. And I thought with that kind of campaign rhetoric, surely he would sign that bill. But when the bill landed on his desk, he played to his right-wing conservative base, and he vetoed it. And my blood was raging. But I was back home with Brad that night, watching the late show. And the news came to the uh, veto. Uh, story, and then they cut to a shot of Santa Monica Boulevard with young gays and lesbians pouring out onto Santa Monica Boulevard, venting their rage against Arnold Schwarzenegger. And we felt the same way, but here we were, comfortable and at home. And so we began discussing it, and we decided, all right, it's time. I need to speak up, and I need to speak out. And I spoke to the press for the first time as a gay man, and I blasted Arnold Schwarzenegger's veto. <laughs> so 
So this is a roundabout way to get back to Howard Stern. <laughs> I had this uh, transactional relationship with Howard Stern. But once I came out, we wanted to be active in the gay liberation movement. And Brad and I talked about it. He said, we said, Howard has a big audience. I was going around, I, I partnered with the Human Rights Campaign and went uh, on a speaking tour throughout the country and speaking at various universities. But I discovered that uh, the people that came to my talks were, one, they were Star Trek fans and they were gay people and allies. We wanted to reach people that weren't allies. I maintain that the broad, decent, fair-minded middle uh, would support us, but they're too busy pursuing uh, their lives, their careers, their families, to really think about uh, other people's gay issues. We need to reach them. And uh, sure, we need to talk to the, uh, those that are already out and the allies, but we need, if we're gonna bring, bring about change, we need to, to speak to the big, middle, unwashed. <laughs> and maybe Howard Stern might give us access to them. The great unwashed. <laughs> and so we decided, all right, let's go on the Howard Stern show and see uh, what will happen. Howard is basically a very decent guy. And uh, his audience is made up of a lot of raunchy people, but they're very decent people as well. And uh, they could be reached. And that's when we discovered that we were reaching and uh, we were affecting a, a larger number of people and more were coming to be with us. And so that's how my relationship with Howard Stern came about. He's a great friend. I ramble a lot, so I appreciate your uh, uh, staying with me as I, I responded to his question in a big, great, big, long, rambling way. Thank you for your patience. It's all right. Uh, my name is Corey. I'm from Iowa. And first off, I think this might be the geekiest question you'll, you've ever gotten. Kinkiest. <laughs> I just responded to a Howard Stewart. Geekiest. Oh, geekiest. My hearing. <laughs> do, do you remember in the early 90s you filmed a uh, a just commercial spot for Paramount Home Video where you came on the bridge of the Enterprise and basically talked about a rebate program that was going on with their videos. You have a very good memory. <laughs> you have no idea. But I only bring it up because you... I remember watching that before a movie when I was in like the second grade and before I knew Star Trek or you and you mentioned you may have found a rebate certificate in this video set. Please don't throw it away. I can't explain it, but the way you said that just stuck with me. And then years later I looked it up on YouTube and and yeah, it's just there now. <laughs> well, you know what? They told me to watch that clock down there, and it reads zero, zero, zero. But you didn't ask a question. You made a statement, right? So I don't have to answer anything. <laughs> My time is up. You guys are a great group of people. You've given us a wonderful day.
Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.